Phil Chalmers is a true crime writer, law enforcement trainer, youth culture specialist and TV personality in America. Phil gets in the mind of serial killers, finding out what makes them commit such heinous crimes. Killers like Garland Milan, Chester Turner, Clyde Gibson, Terry Blair, to name some. I've had a fascination myself with what makes killers do what they do. Now I get to pick Phil's mind. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Even though I'm in the true crime business and I have a podcast and all this, I never forget the pain that this causes. I never forget the victims and they're always with me. I, you know, I speak for the victims and that's why I'm doing this. And I think once you get slammed with life without parole, you know you're going to die in prison. It does kind of shake you up a little bit. If they have nothing to lose, they will confess to unsolved crimes. Well, one thing we know for sure is we are here to stop bullying because if we stop bullying, we stop school shootings. Um, but most of them I've talked to are remorseful. They know they made a big mistake. Don't fall for the predator trap. Sometimes these predators are very smart. Sometimes they're not that smart. Yeah, when you hear these stories and you hear their childhoods and how they came up and, you know, uh, there were some warning signs. A lot of these guys have warning signs and we should have stopped a lot of these murders, but people don't take it that way. And unfortunately, you've had a lot of cases in the UK, too, where teenagers killed little kids and stuff like that. And, you know, we're in this business. I'm sure you are, too, Decker, to save as many kids as we can and do something positive for society. And um, that's why I do what I do. I'm not a fan of true crime. Like I don't like worship this and I don't make memes about it and shit like that, but you know, I'm interested in it. Why would someone do that? How, how in the hell did he even think about doing this? That that's, that's what intrigues me. And um, I, I, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, 35 years. And uh, it's definitely interesting work. The thing that I found crazy Phil, was when Garland told the police that he was addicted to sucking the souls out of people. You know, in 35 years of doing interviews with psychopaths, I've never heard anybody explain what he, what he explained to me. Um, as he was killing the guy, he said he leaned up and he put his face, his mouth, right up to his mouth. And when he breathed his last breath, he sucked that breath in. And he said he felt like he sucked his soul out. And he fell back on his back, lost consciousness, and defecated. Yeah. I've never heard anybody explain that before. Whether you believe it or not, it's surely interesting, even if he thinks that happened, right? Like, like what's his mindset that and then and then and then the crazy part is after he killed two people, he went to the, the local store and confessed, which is that's not normal, right? Um, you and I were talking before we went live, and I I would say this to all your viewers: what is the biggest connection of all serial killers or even all killers that there's no connection? Like everybody's different. Some have nice childhoods, some have horrible childhoods. You know, um, some enjoy it, some really don't enjoy it. Some have sex with the victims, some don't have sex with the victims. Everybody has a, a, a different motivation and, and an upbringing. BTK grew up in a nice church family. I mean, everybody has a different upbringing. Charles Manson was sold for a pitcher of beer at a bar by his mother. So everybody has a different upbringing, and um, it's almost like there's no way to predict it. Would you say, Phil, that serial killers, some of them were just born to kill or were there a, were, were, of the environment, the environment that they grew up in with abuse yeah. and stuff like that? So, you know, it, it's our killers born, our killers made. I believe killers are made um, unless you're born mentally ill, which is possible. If you're not born mentally ill, which is probably five to 10 percent of killers, very small part. I believe killers are made. Something happens to them growing up in their childhood or their early education. Something happens to them that they, they become a killer. So I'm not a big, big believer of that killers are born unless they're born mentally ill. And, and that's a small percentage. This guy, Phil, had three victims, one in 2002, two in 2012. But he actually mutilated them as well. Well, Clyde Gibson has killed way more people than three. Um, 
you know, a little behind the scenes that I don't talk about a whole lot of this on social media, but Klein and I have just agreed to do a book about his life story. So we're working on a book right now. Um, he is the modern day Hannibal Lecter. He is the modern day Hannibal. And um, he's killed as many as John Wayne Gacy. And he's claiming 33. I believe him. Um, he's buried a lot of his victims. We're going to start looking for them. Um, I, I had told you I have a few pieces from my collection. Clyde Gibson, he was a very, he's a very talented guy. Like he was a woodworker. Um, every time I go to visit Clyde Gibson on death row, he will be executed eventually. Uh, he makes me things. And this is something he made me. And I, th I, was, I just thought this is super cool. This is a violin. Now, I, I took this violin <laughs> to a music store and I said, you know, what do you think of this? They said, you could string that violin and play that violin. Like it's that well done. It's made out of popsicle sticks, right? So you can see the popsicle sticks. And he has no equipment. He doesn't have a lathe. He doesn't have machinery. He does this by hand, and it's incredibly – his talent is incredible. Um, Clyde Gibson is – he's just an interesting guy. He was molested as a child. He talks about that now. He finally talks about that. He was molested by a, a female growing up, and he believes that that has a lot to do with his mutilation and his sex with corpses and all that. But <clears throat> this guy takes home women, and this is a big warning sign, you know, Stop going home with people you don't know at a bar. And he um, has sex with them. He strangles them. He has sex with their, their corpses for hours afterwards. And then he cuts off their vaginas and their nipples and he fries them up and eats them. And um, uh, we're going to start finding his bodies. So I'm going to start this book. And the reason I'm writing a book with him is because eventually towards the end of the book, we're going to start try to solve his cold cases. Um, yeah. Clyde Gibson is uh, somebody listen to You can hear it. Listen on my podcast. You can listen on my YouTube channel and uh, wow, crazy. Now, Phil, this guy in 2007 was convicted of killing 10 women, but in 2014, there was an addition, additional four. So they're saying 15 plus, maybe more. I'm going to say he's killed at least 30 or 40. Really? And, um, yeah. Yeah. And once he, he's dealing with his appeal right now for death, the death penalty. He's basically asked me, let me deal with this right now. Once he's done with his appeal, um, I believe he's going to confess. We're going to do a book or something with him, either a book or a TV show. And he's going to confess. He'll be the most prolific serial killer in Los Angeles history, which is, you know, there's a lot of serial killers. The Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. There's a lot of serial killers from L.A. And um, he'll be the deadliest, I believe. Yeah. He actually says to the judge when he was sentenced to death, I'll be back. Yeah. He's uh he's got a little bit of a swagger, uh, Chester Turner. He's known as the South Side Slayer. And um crazy as he had a very normal life. He had a girlfriend, he had a child. Um, you would never know what he was up to. In fact, his girlfriend at the time couldn't believe it, like they were shocked. Yeah. How do these killers feel get away with it for so long over long periods of time? you know like crime 101 if you have a murder <clears throat> most of the murders are you have a connection to the killer and to the victim like there's a connection so you know we find a dead body we automatically look at the husband the wife the the you know the the relatives the boyfriend girlfriend whatever there's usually a connection and most of the murders are solved in the first 48 hours <clears throat> and it's someone that connected to the victim so when you have someone that's not connected to the victim you just drive down the road and kill a stranger. Um, it, it becomes very hard. In the United States, we have about 12,000 murders a year. About 3,000 murders a year are unsolved. So in the course of 10 years, Deca, we have 30,000 unsolved cases. That's a lot of dead bodies with no answers. And um, I always ask the question, who's killing those people? It's either gang members or serial killers. I mean, that's, that's what we have here. By the sounds of it, Phil, Chester Turner was one of them. I mean, do you know when they get, you know when they get given the nickname by the media? Do you think the playoff that and they enjoy it? Yes, I think they do enjoy the nickname. I've never heard anybody say they don't like their nickname. Um, so like BTK gave himself his own nickname. He said, "I'm the BTK Strangler." But most of them, the media does that, and uh, I, I think that they enjoy that. Now, a lot of these guys love the fame and they love the attention. Um. 
But, you know, this is going to be crazy for you, Decca, that a lot of the guys don't like to talk about their murders. I have to pull it out of them. Like, yeah. you'll notice in some of these interviews, I don't really get what I want. Um, if you look at my YouTube videos, sometimes they talk. Some guys like to talk, but most of them don't like to talk about it. So, I mean, there's 50 to 100 guys right now I could interview. Right now, they're ready to go, but they don't want to talk about it. So, to say that they want to talk about their murders – some of them do, and and many of them don't. You know, they, you know what they want to do? You know, all they want to do, they want to kill people. That's what they love to do. Decca likes to go to the gym. I like to eat wings, right? We all have something we love to do. I like to drink wine. They like to kill people. That's their thing. And they they don't care. I don't want to be famous for drinking wine. Just let me drink wine. Leave me a fuck alone. That's what they want to do. I want to strangle women. That's what I do. I don't understand it. I can't relate to it, but that's what they love. And um, something has happened to their brains growing up that, um, that they just thought this is the thing to do. And um, like BTK talked about, he discovered um, these, these old, these old things, these old, these detective magazines. And there was a woman that was tied up and he never forgot that from me. It was like five or 10 years old. Um, you know, John Wayne Gacy, um, started to realize this is a painting by John Wayne Gacy. This is a very rare painting. You can see his autograph there, J.W. Gacy, um, the Pogo, the clown. So he would dress up as Pogo and he, you can see on the back that he actually filled this out when he sent it out from prison, John Wayne Gacy. Um, this is super rare. Um, it's super rare, but he was in the, uh, being a clown and, and, um, he doesn't know how he got into that, but uh, all of a sudden he became a homosexual. He was married with kids and he wanted to he just, he just started enjoying strangling young men. Um, many of you know, Bonnie and Clyde, you've heard of the big Bonnie and Clyde bank robbers, right? So this picture right here has the guys that killed Bonnie and Clyde. If you look at this photo right here, there's a magazine uh, this, is the magazine that was in the back of their vehicle. So they were also into the detective magazines. They would read about themselves in these magazines. And uh, that's a super, super rare piece of crime history in the United States. Charles Manson's pretty famous, even though he's not a serial killer. He was one of the biggest crime uh, personalities in the U.S. And uh, Decca showed this earlier in his video, but he's famous for his, his Life magazine cover, Charles Manson. He would send me Christmas cards. Kind of hard to see here. He sent me Christmas cards. And um, I got a lot of weird stuff from Charlie before he died and uh we're going to open up a museum sometime Decca. we have um like i have a piece of the cloth that covered his body in the morgue um i have a lot of crazy stuff that i have i have a doll head from btk storage shed uh, i have a lot of weird piece of, of ted bunny's kill kit and uh someday we're going to put together a traveling crime museum and uh, i'm going to go out speaking and making appearances and you know we'd love to come to the uk sometime why is the method of murder important in cases filled, you know, with the investigation? Well, you know, the method of murder says a lot about the killer. Um, I always ask the guys when I interview them, why did you shoot people or why did you strangle people? Or why did you stab people? The preferred method most of the time is strangulation. And the reason why the killers like strangulation is it's, it's quiet. It's not messy. Uh, there's no blood, there's no bullets, there's no fragments, there's none of that. And if you dump the body and if it, if it, if the body is there long enough, it becomes where you can't almost tell you, a lot of the times they find the victims and they think they're drug overdoses because they can't tell the cause of death. Yeah. Uh, if you shoot someone, there's bone nicks and stuff. If you stab someone, same thing. But um, some of the guys prefer shooting. Now in 1982, so this guy killed the mother of his children done 21 years, was released, and went on to kill another six in 2004. Well, he was also going to confess to many unsolved murders to me. And um, last minute, he got cold feet and decided to, so we know he has more victims. Just so you know, almost every American serial killer has more victims than the police know about. And that is what I do. That's my mission in life is to uh, befriend these guys and um, – men and women and to basically say, Hey, listen, let's, let's, let's start a relationship here. 
I basically asked them what, you know, um, Deca, you're in prison. I'm going to ask you, what do you, what do you need? You need a TV, you need some food, you need some shoes. Okay. I can help you with that. In, in exchange for that, I want you to help me. I want to solve some cold cases. I want to find some of your victims' bodies. Um, that's become my passion. And um, Deck, I grew up in a messed up, dysfunctional home myself. I started working with teenage killers and school shooters. I did that for the first 20, 30 years. I've been doing this for 35 years. And the last five years, my, my, my whole passion has been serial murder. And I am definitely talking to more serial killers than anybody else in the United States. A lot of people can say they are. They're not. I have files full of letters and, you know, it's crazy. And uh, my mission now until the end of my career is to solve as many cold cases. Yeah. And try to help the victims' families locate their victims' bodies so they can bury them and have, you know, have some closure. And um, that's why I do what I do. Um, so I work in the true crime business. I'm not a fan of true crime. If you're a fan of people being murdered and molested and killed and dumped, I, I don't think I don't think anybody should be a fan of that. I know people are intrigued by it, and so are we. Um, and 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 that's why I do what I do. So. Do serial killers, you know, the, one of the some of the most prolific ones that you spoke to, do they ever speak about other serial killers? Yes. Yeah, I mean, some of them write each other. They can write each other in America in prison. They can write each other. Um, you know. A small percentage talk about other serial killers. Most of them are very quiet. They don't really talk much. They don't use, and they they just enjoyed killing people, and they don't really know why. And they some of them don't even want to be labeled serial killers. They don't like the label. So we have this mentality that these killers love to brag. They want to be famous. That's probably five percent of serial killers. 95% don't want to talk about their murders, don't want to be famous. They turn down all the interviews requests they get. Um, so make sure you guys, you know, that's the truth. And it doesn't, you know, the media makes it seem different.